strong left-handers that can have some of the language dominance shifted in part. Uh, curiously, this does not seem to happen as strongly for emotion or for music processing, which seem to have pretty much the same organization independently of what goes on in terms of the language dominance. So this sort of introduces you to a, a general idea of uh, what has been becoming quite clear in terms of distribution of functions overall in terms of uh, hemispheres and the fact that there is something that can be called justifiably uh, a dominance, a preference, a specialization uh, for certain functions. Now let me tell you a little bit more about a number of other issues that relate to these that have to do with the ability to learn to store and to recall. Now, I'm showing you a, an image of a, a territory that is marked as area 28 is in the center of the brain. Actually, if I go back two slides, you see where it corresponds. Uh, my pointer failed, so I cannot point, I think, um, but area 28 is very clearly marked on the bottom panels and you can see where it is. So now I'm going to give you a close-up of area 28, and there it is in the middle, perihippocampal gyrus, and you're getting a close-up, and this is a real brain. This is not a drawing, it's a real brain. That structure is absolutely vital for you to make memory. So if you're going to remember anything of this talk tonight, if you're going to remember that you saw me here speaking and I was speaking about the brain, um, you will have to have this structure in full function and you will have to convey to this structure a certain number of signals about what you heard and what you saw and that structure then uses yet another brain structure called the hippocampus and will actually create the set of signals that will lead to printing of a memory. And if this structure does not work right, what is going to happen is that your impressions are going to vanish in something like 30 to 45 seconds and off they go, they don't get to be printed. So what you're looking at in that area 28, in this area of the hippocampal system, is something that allows you to print a message, to print some information that you're getting into the brain. How that is done is extremely complex, and obviously I'm not going to be able to tell you all the details, although we're beginning to know a lot of those details. But just think of the beauty of the fact that this structure is the one that is going through a variety of interventions to allow you from having a fleeting memory that just lasts half a minute to a memory that can last an entire lifetime. Um, there are all sorts of beautiful things about this system. We know, for example, that in most people, the left part of the system, since there are two, a left and a right, the left one tends to be related to memories of verbal aspects of the communication, so language primarily, whereas the right one tends to be related to forms, tends to be related, for example, to memory of music uh, and to memory of visual impressions or other auditory impressions. And so there is a division of labor, but in the end, it is through this structure that you can form uh, memories of, for example, meeting a person, knowing who that person is, seeing a landscape and knowing that landscape, and on and on. That is absolutely necessary. Now, as you can imagine, if this structure is damaged by disease, you are not going to be able to form normal memories. So now I'm going to show you what the brain looks like when it has a disease called Alzheimer's disease. And so you see on top a normal uh, uh, inner side of the temporal lobe with that region, the area 28, maintained. By the way, the EC stands for entorhinal cortex, which is an important cerebral cortex that is there. And now you see down below two examples of brains with Alzheimer's disease. And in those brains, you see that that region that is marked EC is very atrophied, is very shriveled. 
And that is one of the hallmarks of Alzheimer's disease. So when that structure gets thinned out and when it loses brain cells, what is going to happen is that you're no longer able to commit to memory things that you can be processing, things you hear, names, places, uh, music, and so on. Uh, and that is a very important uh, um, discovery of the past 20 years, is the selectivity of that area. By the way, Alzheimer's disease also creates other points of damage, but this tends to be one of the very early ones. And what is going to happen is that through a variety of mechanisms, uh, it will not be possible for the brain to hold on to the different components of memories. And very interestingly, it's not that the memories are in that place. It's just that this place, together with another structure that is underneath it, uh, known as the hippocampus, is not functioning normally and will not allow the different components of memories to be literally printed and put in place in a relatively permanent form. And when that fails, you're no longer able to uh, create those memories. So this is, uh, I wanted to give you th this example to tell you that we now have a pretty good grasp of some of the conditions, some of the reasons why there are diseases, for example, such as Alzheimer's disease. What is happening in the brain when it happens? And there's a, a welter of information about what goes on in the cells, what goes on in different linked systems. Um, but the fact is that we do not have yet a treatment for this. I think that it is quite possible that within the next decade there will be uh, very substantial pro progress made in this. But I just wanted to use this example to give you a sense of how things that happen in the brain, whether it is a memory or uh, whether it is the ability to love or the ability to make a good judgment, tends to depend on different components working together well. And if those components don't, don't work together well, you just cannot create memory, you cannot make good judgments, you cannot make selections of uh, perceptions, you cannot uh, decide what to do. And this is an example of one of the several areas that are important for you to create a memory of anything, a memory of your experiences with other uh, people, a memory of the places you go, a memory of the things that you would like to do because your own plans are also being uh, memorized. Now let me tell, turn to another aspect of uh, neuroscience on which we have made a lot of progress and that is the area of emotions and feelings. And I would like to start with a very simple distinction, definitions and distinction of what are emotions and what are feeling. Um, very often these two words tend to be used as uh, um, interchangeable. So uh, certainly in English, many people use the word emotion or the word feeling almost interchangeably, uh, and that is a problem for the research and that is a problem for the understanding of what really goes on. So what you have there on the screen is a very rapid definition of the difference between emotions and feelings. So emotions are, in the end, action programs that are related to one's homeostasis. They are not the subjective feeling. Whereas the feelings are the perceptions of what goes on during the emotions. So let me break this down a little bit. So when you have uh, an emotion, what you have is a program of action that allows you to do certain things very rapidly and without even having to think about it. Think about the emotion fear. When you have fear in relation to something, for example, a loud noise, uh, something that comes towards you at very fast speed, you don't think about what is really happening to you. Something in you happens as a reaction very rapidly that causes you, for example, to uh, be startled or take cover uh, or um, you know, disappear and run away. 
what is really happening is that this, as the, the slide says, is an action program. It's something that has evolved through a long, long time in the history of evolution and has given you a way of coping with a particular problem. You don't think through the problem. You don't have to use your reasoning to decide to take cover or to, de to decide to run away in front of the fear. It is something that is already preset and that allows you to do that. And it's something that is highly present and conserved in uh, life systems. So you find the reaction, for example, of fear uh, in lots of other animals. You don't need to have a big brain. You don't need to be thoughtful and cultivated to run away from fear if you hear loud noises or if somebody threatens you. You do those reactions automatically. Those are things that are part of your repertoire of behavior. So, in, of course, you have many other kinds of emotion. You don't have just fear, but you have happiness and sadness and anger, and a variety of emotions that I will talk about in a few minutes, which are the social emotions. So these are repertoires of actions that are available to you and on the basis of which you can then build more complicated behaviors. Now, feelings are entirely different, uh, an entirely different animal. Feelings are what you perceive when you are having an emotion. So if you suddenly are confronted with something that ought to cause fear and you react with alarm and startle. That reaction is a program of actions and is automatic by and large, but then the way you feel about it, that's a feeling. The way you perceive that set of actions and then you have literally an idea of what is going on in your body and in your mind when you are having the emotion. This is a very important distinction that has been worked out through uh, a lot of recent uh, work over the past 10 years in, um, in uh, uh, neuroscience. Now, uh, when you look at that slide, I'm gonna have it very briefly, just for you to have an idea of the detail with which we now know what is happening. You see there, a number of stages and structures of the emotional process. And you can see with number one, two, three, and four, the different layers of the process. And on the right, you see the parts